So next up is Prof. Batch to talk to us about Lori, what it is and how you can use it. Get ready guys, the talk is starting now. Okay, <laughs> nice. Hi, I'm Prof. Butch. Um, so, um, Nick Shell is a superpower. Who here agrees with me? Okay, I see. <laughs> uh, why is Nick Shell a superpower? Right? So, I have a few points, there's probably more, but uh, first off, you can define ad, ad hoc environment for your project. It sets all the environment variables you want, just works for everything that's in Nixt packages, essentially, which is, uh, by now, probably everything, right? Um, you can check the file into the Nixt version, con uh, into the Git version control, and every single developer gets the same environment. Wonderful. No problem w with works on my machine, or at least less problems now. Uh, you get as fine-grained dependencies as you want or need, but you still get everything cached from the, from the Hydra. Also beautiful. Um, and basically, it supersedes everything from pip env over virtual env over whatever your language uses. Just has one environment and everything works. And I mean, you can even use it on CI and you have the same environment on CI. You can get around all that travel stuff and just use Nix shell on CI and it works. So, Nix shell is a superpower. However, it doesn't make you inv invincible, right? Oh. And it was never intended to be a superpower, actually. Because uh, the first idea was, oh, uh, probably Echo thought, oh, I want to debug what I'm actually writing here. So I want to debug the builder, essentially. So uh, what Nixshell actually does is just gives you the environment of the derivation you're working with right now. Exactly the same thing with all the compiler set, with all the strange environment variables you want. Um, but people uh, soon realized that it's actually a lot better than just being a debugging tool because it's very powerful. Um, so everybody uses it right now. And of course, uh, it's, it's still a superpower, but it also doesn't make you invincible. There's quite a few problems with Nix shell right now. Um, the the project, project, uh, projects are getting bigger and bigger. So once you start having a few developers working on that and a few dependencies and maybe even multiple Nix packages clones, your instantiation time is going to go up. And your Nix shells are going to use more and more time to open. So we had uh, cases where it took like one and a half minutes on Linux and then even 20, up to 20 minutes on macOS, right? On business macOS MacBooks who have these, uh, these file checkers in the background who check every file access. So now Nix instantiation takes 20 minutes. Uh, you garbage collect your Nix store, suddenly all your project dependencies are gone, you have to re-download everything again. Time for the waiting game. <laughs> um, something changed, you have to exit Nix shell, you have to enter Nix shell again, um, you have to wait for rebuilds, and so on. And of course you can only use this in your shell, so good luck with setting up Emacs with that. Um, there's a way to do that, but I'm going to talk about it later. Um, so we thought about those pro problems and uh, we came up with the following. Um, this is Lori. Lori solves all these problems for you. So my thesis, or the thesis of this talk is, uh, if Nix shell is, or Nix is Batman, then Lori is like Robin, right? The, the small helper, superhero. And I'm of aware, of course, that Batman doesn't actually have any superpowers because Batman uses cool technology like Nix and Nix Shell and Lori. Okay, before I come to the main act of this talk, a short history of how this came to pass. Because Graham had already started experimenting with improving Nix Shell, I think over a year ago, maybe two years ago. So he ha I have ideas. And then a company came along called Target. Yeah, we want, we want to improve that. We have problems with this. And Graham said, okay, we are tweaked. We can do that for you. Just say what you want and we can do it. Okay. At least that's what I, how I think this went. Uh, it was probably a bit, a bit different from that, but yeah. Okay, we know history. It's time to meet the villains because we already have the superheroes. 
So uh, Robin was thinking he wants to develop on this project, right? He CDs into his project, he opens a Nix shell, and nothing happens. A few minutes later, oh, okay. Why, this, why did it take so long? Yesterday, just like, like a few hours ago, maybe yesterday, I closed my Nix shell, I closed my desktop, I went home, came back, now I want to start working. Like maybe I have a few ideas and boom, have to wait for a few minutes. Yeah, why does it take this? And of course, I think you, you probably know why, um, but uh, Robin was asking this to himself. Uh, Batman didn't seem, seem to care very much because it was a good time to get a coffee or two, right? But Robin is young and he wants to do something and so he has a problem with this. So he decided to find out why this happens. So he decided to look at the source code. So this is Nix shell, like this is the actual implementation of Nix shell. I shorten it down a bit, like to, from, <laughs> uh, origin originally this was a Perl script and this got ported to um, C++ by Schlevi and now it's just in the Nix build.cc file, you can just look at it. It's not that simple but it's also not terribly hard and it's all in one file so you can follow the code, fl the code flow. But in, in essence, I think I pretty much shortened this down to a few lines. So the first, step is, the first step is you get your shell.nix, or nix gets the shell.nix, and it calls this function derivation from path, which returns a DRV file. So, so this instantiates the nix expression, and then uh, it gives you the DRV file. Then it takes the dependencies of the DRV file, because remember we're opening a shell here, so we don't want the derivation, we want the dependencies, and builds all of these. Then it gets the environment from the DRV file and sets it for the process it's going to, to call. The process is going to be a bash with some RC file and it's xx into bash. And then basically Nix, uh, the, the Nix thing is dead and bash runs with the environment of your shell.nix. Okay, thought Robin. So why is this taking so long? The first two lines. Because every time you want to exec into the bash, it's going to have to open the shell.nix, evaluate everything, every dependency in Nix. That's so basically a functional language, so and maybe not that optimized, so it takes a while, and then it can exec into bash. How could you solve that? Just use the last build you did yesterday. The right? So Laurie solves this by keeping around the last build you did, and when you enter your project, you immediately get the environment of the last build you were in. And then it starts in the background giving you the new environment if something changed. And most of the time, to be honest, nothing really changes. Second problem. Uh, Robin opens, like Robin wants to run his command something. And he sees this message. Oh, hmm. Okay, of course Robin's a Nix developer, so he immediately types these this line, and of course the next store has grown by a few hundred gigabytes in the meantime. Uh, so, all oh right, there was this handy dandy command that you can, can give to the garbage collect, it's called max free, 30 gigabytes. Ah, should be enough, right? Nice, I have space again. Let's open next shell. Nothing happens. Why is there no GC root for my Nix shell? This can't be this hard. So, very, e very easy. Laurie just creates a GC root for your project. Then, if you get a new version of your project, it just overwrites writes the old one, so it uh, is available for GC again. So you always have it in in your. It, it never gets garbage collected when you don't want it to be garbage collected. Uh, third, pr third problem. Um, Oh, my notes are a bit too, too big, sorry. Okay. Uh, you're in your Nix shell, Robin is in his Nix shell. He wants some, some other person comes and says, oh, check out my new PR, it has a few changes. Okay, so get check out some PR. Now run the project. Huh, new tool is missing. I didn't know about new tool, probably the other developer added it in the meantime, right? So now, now Robin leaves the next shell, Robin enters the next shell. <laughs> Ooh, 
why they didn't start evaluating the new state of the project when he switched the git commit. So the idea here is that once you check out something and basically the files, the dependencies that you need to open your Nix shell change, you immediately want it to run in the background and start building, preferably on your company's server, the new version of all the tools you need. So that once you try to run it, it's, well, if possible, already finished and you don't have to manually exit Nix shell and manually enter Nix shell again. Um, what up? And uh, it should also pr provide you a way of to integrate this into your environment. So it should give you a steady stream of messages that say, oh, this changed, now I'm starting instantiation. Okay, I'm, I'm done instantiating, now I start, I'm starting the build. And so you uh, uh, immediately see that when it's done, you can say, okay, switch to the new environment and now I can try this again. Um, okay, now we have something that works for our shell, but how can we actually integrate that in our editor? For example, you might want some things like, like I don't know, these squiggly lines under your code when you miss something and you actually want those tools to come from your environment, right? Um, and, and Robin kind of starts dreaming about this, this world where he, where he can just switch buffers between projects and immediately have the new environment in his, uh, in his project without the, without the editor blocking for another one and a half minutes every time he switches between projects. Uh, so there's this beautiful tool called DeerEnv, which is written by the wonderful Zimba TM. He's, he's here somewhere, I guess, uh, which basically takes care of that for you. And it has integrate, integration for all ed different editors, for different shells, whatever. Um, and Laurie just provides you an in integration into DeerEnv. So you add like one line of, of code to the DeerEnv, uh, the N4C, and it just starts working with the normal Laurie environment. Um, it never blocks anything because it still it uses the last working version when you switch environments. Um, and now that all these problems are solved, Robin is pretty satisfied, uh, is satisfied and decides to tell Batman about it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a pro this is a project. It's on GitHub. Um, we have good first issues for you to solve. Please try it out. Uh, it's very easy to install. Um, it's about one line of code, nixenv minus if, some path, uh, some, some link to a rolling release branch. Um, you will have access to the tool. We have a handy dandy tutorial for you to step by step set it up uh, in the repo. Um, yeah, there's some good first, first issues. So if you want to program some Rust for the Nix, uh, ecosystem and Hack, uh, Hacktoberfest is still going on, right? So, um, and feel free to join the Freenode channel. Um, we have a few things planned for the next few weeks and months. Um, first up are services. So now that the um, the base integration is already working, we want to think further of like how can you um, get Nix to integrate into your projects better. For example, if you have some web project, you usually need, need a database server and you need some, I don't know, microservices running. And Nix can provide you the environment, but Nix can't start the services for you. So right now you have to write bash scripts and then you have to care about the lifetime cycle of these services. So the idea is that, um, that Lori should have a sub-command which just takes care of that for you. And we're still thinking about how to design that. Um, we want to add some linters to your Nix project. So uh, a common problem is you see this line here, which is basically always wrong, because what that does is it copies the whole directory you're referencing into the store before it does anything. And if that directory is your current uh, source directory with all the debug outputs in it, then it's going to change every time basically you run Nix or Nix shell. So it will have to copy everything, and uh, so you have to filter those. And uh, we want Laurie to be able to warn you if you do something stupid like that. 
so that new, new programmers don't run into this anymore. Um, and of course that entails that we want to be able to um, write these source filters and make them easily debuggable as well. Um, and finally we want to upstream some of our changes into Nix proper because uh, it's important that other people can use these tools as well. Right now we're just uh, hacking around Nix and uh, like uh, Nix build minus VV and parsing the output, like probably other people are doing for their tools, but it would be really nice if Nix can um, tell you what it's doing in the background while it's evaluating or while it's building something. Cool. So in conclusion, what Lowry gives you? It gives you instant environments for your projects. Last state, you, you left the project, you, you enter again and it's there again. It also sets up GC rules for your project. You never lose it when you GC. Uh, it watches dependencies in the background, so basically Nix files, uh, Nix packages, check out JSON files, everything. Um, and auto, auto builds in the background, and it has nice editor support without blocking the editor, even Emacs. Yeah. Uh. Thanks. Any questions or input, whatever? Maybe, maybe we can do a show of hands. Who here uses Lory already? Okay, that's potential. <laughs> um, I was wondering, is it necessary to install Lory first or can I ship it with the shell.nix file and just have people use Nix shell and under the hood kind of use this Lory feature, like if a bootstrapping of, of the tool? I think you can, actually. I haven't thought about this, but uh, it should be possible. I mean, you have the setup problem, where the bootstrapping problem, but once you have your Lory environment, you're going to have Lory in the, in the project, right? So the next time you CD into the project, uh, when you have Dirim set up, you will have Lory in the environment again and can use that. So the way I use it, I don't, uh, I don't really change the NVRC of the project to use Nix. I prefer to uh, change the dear and my dear NVRC for my system to use Lori, and that way I'm not forcing anyone to use it. Um, and it's just you know like my decision. So. Oh, so there's a there's a system wide NVRC file. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so instead instead of like forcing it on all the developers who use the project, I let them make the choice. I just leave uh, my project nvrc with use nix, and I only change my own dear nvrc file to use lori. Um, okay. That said, this. Um, I do have a question. Um, so, by the way, thanks for uh, for lori. It's a great uh, like product daemon tool, whatever. Um, I was wondering whether there is a way to like tell while it's building in the background so that I can, I know, like make my prompt change while it's still building so that I know. Uh, because right now it's like, it's like press enter, 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 and I it's wait. It's actually something we want to do next uh, to have a stream of information you can integrate into your window manager or your Emacs or whatever. Okay, so coming up. So just uh, printing like line-based JSON output of what is going on at the moment and you can filter that and All integrate right. it into your system if you want to. Sweet, cool, thanks. Uh, it's m not like a question, but maybe a proposal uh, uh, to push uh, Lori as a core Nix. Um, yeah, I think that you can't merge it to Nix uh, code repo, but you may provide Lori as a Nix plugin, so we can distribute uh, Nix with plugins, and Lori is one of the plugins, and it will be able to do so the things. So I personally had very bad experiences with Nix plugins because you have the very, very bad bootstrapping problem there. Like when you have a Nix without a plugin and then getting the plugin in. And, but 
I don't see the problem why we why you wouldn't install it like a normal program and use it. Uh, I have a related comment. I was thinking about something similar a year ago, and uh, I actually started implementing it as a Nix plugin. But it turns out that Nix plugins cannot uh, register comments additional, like they are meant to, but this code doesn't work. And I have a PR open since December that fixes this. So if someone can help me get it merged into Nix, that would be great. And then we would have a lot of amazing Nix plugins with comments and stuff. Thanks. <laughs> When you switch branches and Lori adapts uh, the environment to the possibly new required packages, um, how do you keep track of uh, what GC routes you, you still need? Or do you have some sort of UI of listing those and uh, maybe saying, okay, this branch has been merged, so I won't ever be needing this anymore? And if so, do you need use the, the branch name somewhere so that you can recognize that it's old? So right now it only basically it has a it has one place for each repository and it overrides the GC root every time you you switch the environment. But we could add something. I mean this is this is all experimenting, right? We're just trying to experiment with what you got and see what's uh, nice for the users. So if you have any ideas of how to do that, because like GC root management is a really hard problem uh, that that we really should uh, focus on uh, on solving. That the user can say which ones, uh, which uh, dependencies they want to keep and w which not. I, uh, if I can make a suggestion, I think it would be great if you sort of keep a log where you say why a GC root exists, so that you just say because it's it's a hash, so pretty unique, and then have a, a text file somewhere saying this log was this this GC root was initiated because of this command at this date, so then you have some context by which you can remember if it's still needed or not. So, so if everybody, anybody here wants to write a separate tool which manages G GC root with like an, in, an interface that we can use, then we just add support for that. Because that's something that's completely auto orthogonal, I think, and that's required by a lot of project that you, projects that use Nix. That would be a great small project to do or, exp yeah. Does it have something like update all environments that it knows about? Uh, sorry, which which kind of environments? Um, like uh, you said that it could, uh, it already tracks GC routes for all of those projects that you're working on. Does it have something like update all? Update all? Update all of them, like rebuild update all of them all when of I them. do next channel update. No, we don't have something like that currently, but it shouldn't be hard to add if you n need it. But does it track uh, the directories it's themselves, not just the GC routes? So we have a, a daemon part of Lowry, uh -huh. which basically uh, manages all the watchers, and uh, which uh, um, has a socket where other Lowry tools communicate with it. Uh, and basically, when, when Lowry is running, it will track which projects it's watching at the moment. But okay, there's no so global st uh, stateful re um, file somewhere which. Uh, has a state of which projects there exist, when you CD into the like project, no database. It would check that now. Huh? When you see the into when you see the into the project, it would check that, right? And uh, there's a in the cache directory. There's basically a hash of the path of the project. Is it possible to run it without the daemon part? Hmm? Is it possible to run Lorry without the, the daemon part? Uh, there's a command called Lorry watch minus minus once, which only runs it f once. Um, and it still has the um, if you use it, like if you use it with the, uh, with Direnv, it still has the property that it will always switch to the last time you ran this command. Thank you. Thank you.